Hello. Welcome to Football Journeys, a B5 consultancy podcast presented by me, Matt Hemsworth. And me, Fraser Franks. Football Journeys is a podcast that ignores the glitz and the glamour of the beautiful game in favour of the pain, the graft and the rejection. Uh, For my part, I've been a media lawyer for nearly 20 years now and I work with clubs and I work with players to help protect their reputation, their privacy, but ultimately it's about protecting the well-being of the young men and women uh, that go through that journey through the game that we love. And for me, I've been through that journey. I was an academy player at Chelsea and Brentford before setting on a career in the lower leagues with the likes of Luton Town, Stevenage and Newport County. Before my career ended at the age of 28, I went to a heart defect. B5 Consultancy is about combining that experience to help players young and old, um, to make good decisions off the pitch, uh, but also to be there to support players when life doesn't go according to plan. In this series, we're talking to Liverpool FC's class of 2013-14. Those lads that came through that famous academy at Kirby, but didn't quite make it through to realise their Anfield dream. This is Football Journeys. This week we were joined at the Hope Street Hotel by Darius Waldron, a boy from a tough part of Manchester and an even tougher upbringing. Darius joined Liverpool at the age of 13 and quickly established himself as a strong and athletic defender. His scholarship didn't go according to plan though and he was released at the age of 18. What followed was a roller coaster, a failed scholarship to the US followed by a struggle to find purpose and ultimately and tragically a spell at Her Majesty's pleasure. This episode, which we have split into two parts, is ultimately an uplifting one. Darius has now wrestled control of his destiny and is very much looking forward to the future. Strap yourselves in for this episode as we hear Darius' story. Darius, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me as well. Uh, We wanted to start off by, well let's start at the beginning. Tell us about your early years. Tell us about what was was little Darius like, what was was your upbringing like in Hume, Manchester? So yeah, um, just like every other... Uh, normal young lad, young boy, um, in growing up in central Manchester. Um, from a family of four, um, I'm the youngest, four, four older sisters, and uh, and my mother. She uh, she raises she raises all. Um, just uh, from a council estate uh, from Hume, like he said. Um, but for my first couple of years, uh, we lived in Mosside, uh, neighbouring Hume. Um, I was like my my youngest sister's uh, 33, and I'm 23, so there's like a 10 year gap between like me and them so by the time I would say 10 they was 20 already so you know um, it quite quickly become me and my mum uh, at a young age and they'd all moved on and started their own families and and whatnot so uh, my early years are from it I can just be me and my mum really I started playing like for a little Saturday club I turned 10 and I was in years just going into year six uh, the last year last year in primary school and um I got a lift in with my friend's mum, um, who played on the team with me, and you know he's, I was I was quick, um, a big build, but I couldn't play football for anything. And um, I just I, from the ages of 10 to 12, I used them two years to like try and understand what football was, what a position meant, what being what the, what the defence midfield, you know, what all their jobs were, and just kind of use whatever experience and what I could learn through my friend and his mum and all my teammates at that, you know, at Fletcher Moster, the team was called at the time, um, use them experiences and, you know, gather them in for myself because there was nobody really around that was, like, guiding me in terms of my football in, in, in that way or anything like that. We know from talking to you before, it was a tough environment and when I hear the words Moss Side and Hume, they're tough areas yeah. in Manchester. Um, I know that, that home wasn't always perfect and I know that alcohol was a bit of a feature in, in the house for you. Um, how, how did your mum cope with that yeah. and then get over that and how did you cope with that and how did it influence you? Um, it was, yeah, so it, alcohol did play a big, has played a, uh, a big part of my life and influenced many decisions that I've made today and that I've made in, in the past. Um, she's so my mother, for example, she struggled with alcohol. So often the case I would be because it would be me and my mum living at home then, and like it would I'd often have to deal with altercations where she might be like intoxicated or you know she's upset or sad, and um, I didn't really really know what was going on at the time. I just knew that she, you know she was um, distraught, and this this was like a, a period that lasted for quite a long time since you know uh, my nana's passing, but. Um, 
many occasions I can remember like, yeah, having to like get her off the floor, get her into bed, things like that. Like she's too drunk to do this, too drunk to do that. I've got school the next day. Um, I suppose they're kind of like the hidden things that you, you know, you don't really bring out in primary school and stuff and things like that, football. Um, so it, it was an escape going to train with my, you know, with my team on a Friday and then going to play on a Saturday. Um, she doesn't drive my mum or and my sisters, my sisters weren't all driving at the time, but they were already fully committed with their own families and jobs. So um, if it wasn't for my friend and his, and his mum at the time, you know, taking me to my, yeah, to my sessions and the games, I just would have had no chance of And I guess in going there, there, you're seeing the coaches and you're seeing some positive male role models at that point, and therefore, you know, football's something you're gravitating to because it's, it's giving you positivity. It's giving you a masculinity that is positive. Yeah. Um, which then dragged us towards Liverpool. Now, you were a late starters, wrong way of putting it, but a lot of the lads start at age nine. You arrived at the club at, was it 13, 12 or 13? Um, 12, yeah. So, so, so there's a 12-year-old man surrounded by all these scousers. Yeah, yeah. Years. How was that? Um, it's crazy. Um, I, you know, I started to understand football more, playing for Fletcher Moss, like 11 years old, and I left for high school. And then, um, and then Liverpool, I mean, I'd only been playing like Saturday league like skills training, having games with Fletcher Moss from the ages of 10 to 12. And I, I visited a, uh, a training, sorry, it was an, a pre-season tournament and I was 12 years old, just gone into year eight in high school. And, um, and we, we played the tournament and we think I got to the final and we lost. And um, the coach at the time, he said, he came up to me and said that um, Everton, and Liverpool, the academies were have been like in contact with me about you, and um, you know they they've asked if you'd you know come and pay the academies visits for trials and stuff. So to me, you know, to hear that at the age of twelve, only been playing football for two years, um, it's like I was flabbergasted. I didn't, I didn't even really come, like under, understand how much of of an achievement or you know what that could turn into at the time you know what, what it'd become so do you remember um i can remember my first day walking to an academy do you remember your first day of liverpool training absolutely was it brutal were you nervous absolutely it's the yeah. scariest scariest thing i've ever done um yeah we was in the car park on the outside and you walk in and at the time the first thing you seen was um like the it was the side of the indoor astro uh pitch that we had there and on, on the side of it, it was a huge LFC emblem, like huge. And you remember you're just looking, looking up at it, thinking like, wow, like the grass is cut pretty much perfectly to, you know, like a, <laughs> a haircut. And um, you know, you've got the main pitch in front of the academy and you walk in. And that was for me the moment when I realised that this is like, you're pretty much not going to get any better than mm. what this is for my age, um, developing as a footballer. Um, what about your teammates? Ability, ability wise, um, like way off. There was like I was uh, playing with the, the likes of um, in my age group, Ryan Kent, Harry Wilson, um, Jordan Ross, uh, Louis Robles, like players that you know they they'd been they were also twelve like me, but they'd been there five years prior and had tra like the training and um, kind of the, the football guidance, shall we say, um, before that age. So. I'd say catch up was definitely the phrase I'd be using to, uh, you know, when I seen the players. But one thing, one thing that did stand out for me is that I was a lot bigger and faster than everybody else in here as well, which probably contributed to me um, to me signing eventually. Yeah. Did it change your social life at all? Was you did you go from Darius, a normal lad in the playground, to Darius and I played for Liverpool? Did that um, bring any extra attention or anything like that? Um, well, yeah, in in a way. Um, I was good at football, like I, when I was playing at Fletcher Moss. But I, I was, I already knew lads from Manchester that played for United and played for City. So um, it it did kind of feel like I was now put in that pot of, you know, a young high schooler playing at you know one of the best academies in the country, if not worldwide, um, with a sense of still not really believing that I should be part of it because I've not. It's all it's all still new to me. So. Um, and I and think in terms of that as well, um, I wasn't, I didn't really realise the significance of what it was to play for like an academy of such, um, 
yeah, a lot, it was a lot, a lot of pressure to deal with at the time, but it, it felt great that I could like, I could say, yeah, like I'm, I'm Darius and I play for Liverpool, yeah. Did, was it quite difficult for you to see some of the other lads at Liverpool? Um, and we never know what's going on in everyone else's backgrounds, but we, you know, we'll talk to some of the other lads who've got different backgrounds to you. Like Tom Brewer would have been one of um, the lads that you played alongside. Um, you talked about Harry Wilson, you talked about Ryan Kent, and you'd probably have an imagination of what their homes look like and then you knew what your home looked like. Yeah. Did you feel as though it wasn't a level playing field between you and, and some of those other lads? Um, I felt like the opportunity that we were all given on the pitch was a level, a level playing field um, as, as schoolboys. Um, it was more so the fact that I had um, now been, like, been put with this group of lads who have like great support networks around them, mum, dad. Um, you know, a lot of them, you know, the majority of them had the parents at training sessions after work every day. Um, I couldn't get a lift to training from Manchester. I couldn't get a lift to my games on a Sunday, um, which obviously Liverpool provided the travel for, which obviously I've been eternally grateful for and for many other things as well. But I think the, le the level playing field, it was just more, more so the fact that there was nobody there really. So like, it was just dealing with it more myself. This is this is just life juggling everything, um, you know the games, the training midweek, everything, school, my grades. Um, I was in top set for luckily, you know, all the way through school, um, which is remarkable in and of itself, of course. Yeah, which is remarkable as well. Um, I managed to come out with eleven GCSEs and stuff. Um, school was just kind of school and football. For me, growing up between the ages of 12 to 16 was escaping, for sure. I never, I never got on the bus um, at 15 thinking, oh, like, school. Like, I, I got up thinking, like, school. It's never, a chance. Never escape. Yeah, right? yeah, like, a chance to... I wasn't bothered about the classes. I already, I already knew I was at the level I needed to be in terms of education. I could play football on the Astro, and then I'm, I'm probably going to get, you know, day release on a Monday, get picked up and go and play with some of the, the best 15 year olds in the country um, at the academy and then go home. And then I know one of the things that clubs do, and this is something that Fraser mentioned to me, is put kids in digs to cut down on the travel and to provide uh, a kind of second family. And I think you went into digs, didn't you? When, when did that yeah. happen and how was that experience for you? Um, the digs experience was, for me personally, it was brilliant um, in terms of my relationship with the digs and the family that I, I met. Um, and for anybody that doesn't understand that, that's when, um, like you said, somebody who's 16 is gonna graduate from the academy, become an apprentice at the, at the club, and where they travel from, like me, for example, 30 odd miles from Manchester, it's pretty, it's too much for the uh, schedule that uh, we'd had, it, had here. So we'd all be placed in, you know, in families that had been obviously like checked by the club, and they'd take us in and house us pretty much as, you know, their own, their own child. Um, we all got different families and I actually went to a family on my own. Um, a couple of lads went together. I went to um, a family called the, the, the Talent Family um, and they were in Prescott in the outskirts of Liverpool. Um, they, I was speaking to Fraser earlier, they, they actually played a huge part of my YT, my um, scholarship because through a, a lot of the bad times they were often there when nobody else was so I say I had no male figure or no figure at all to go and reflect to when I was um, facing like negative times um, you know my, my scholarship was horrendous at times where like there was things where I'd, I didn't really even want to go and home and tell my digs parents because I thought like it's pretty embarrassing however they made it like so comfortable for me, like literally to go in the fridge when I want to go in the fridge and do what I want to do. Like, um, gave me all the support I needed. I never, I can't remember for once, I, like ever needing to ask for anything or, you know. So to have that consistently every single day, um, you know, that support, not just from um, the dad and the mum, but the kids taking me in themselves as like a, an older brother and. Um, I were from different places, so you know, they'd never met anybody like me before, and 
um, it was fantastic. It was it was so so uh, helpful for me to have them there every single day. It's a, it's a part of football that the general football fan doesn't have a clue about this kind of thing. I speak to people outside of football and they they almost can't believe that this happens. But a lot of lads come from abroad. They come from you know different parts of the UK, and it is it's a huge role. The 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 house parent is a huge role because it isn't just you know, cooking and cleaning and letting this lad stay at your house, it is becoming the mum and dad. Yeah. It's, it's a much bigger role and it, um, the clubs are paying a lot more attention to it and the vetting process is now a lot more thorough. Um, but I have seen it go wrong personally at some of the lower clubs I've played for in my career where players have come over from different countries or from different parts of the UK and have really struggled. Um, they've gone home, haven't had a relationship with their house parent, they've just gone up to their room they've become depressed, um, you know, you'd finish training at two o'clock and then you've got the whole day to do nothing. Yeah. Um, a lot of them would then go into gambling, they'd go and sit in betting shops, they'd start drinking, they start eating rubbish because sometimes the house parent was going out and not cooking them food or leaving them stuff. So I think people don't realise how big of an impact it is and it's something that I saw on you and I said, you know, I noticed you had a tattoo on your, on your wrist and it just shows how much of an impact that yeah. Tell, yeah tell us uh, Fraser told me this yeah story, but I haven't heard it firsthand so tell us about the tattoo on your wrist I, yeah I got um I I was having the tattoo done on my uh, forearm and I, I wanted to add um the the initials of the first names of the family that I stayed with um during my two years uh, at Diggs because of just literally to dedicate like my gratitude towards just how much they helped me during that uh, period um like Fraser said you know a lot of players from abroad, from here, they they come. They'll will train or will do whatever we need to do during the day, and they'll come back to the to the Diggs family or to the house, and they can go into other lanes like gambling and you know feeling like they, they're the cooped up in the house and they want to get out. But for me, no, it was often an escape. Um, I, I would have a, a bad experience at the academy during the day, um, and I'd go back and and I'd really enjoy being with them um, and. I've, yeah, I wanted to make it clear to them that, you know, how just how influential they were. Yeah, it, like once I was 16 and, you know, I'd be, be moving out permanently into my into my digs home, it was like a release, like, you know, it, it was going from being the, that that kid that was, you know, played for Liverpool on a on a Sunday, mo Sunday morning, that trained every evening, that went to school and then that lived that double life on the weekend as well. Uh, and you know, and throughout the week at, at different times, um, it was like it's done. Like you, you know, you, you can move to you're gonna move to Liverpool and and start like a your new life almost. Um, if you must, you know, have an opportunity to be in a house and not gonna use the word well the word normal, but like what it's like to you know daily life. Take the kids to school, come home, work, and the love there because I got the love from home, but. Um, this was a different kind of love, like, you know, it was it was completely different, so um, it was a great release going there. Um, and then, like I said, having all my difficulties during the during the uh, the scholarship on the pitch and then having them there when I'm off the pitch and how they helped me in, a, in, in that way. Um, Cause there was, a, there was a, I guess, a short period of time where things were going well at Kirby for you and therefore were going, and also going well in digs, but then it started to get difficult, and I think I'm right in saying that it's became difficult pretty much as soon as you signed scholarship. Yeah. Um, I know that you worked really well with Mick Bill, and then there was a change of coach, and well, the way you put it, the coach didn't fancy you. Yeah. Well, that made life difficult. Um, uh, I think there was a long, there was a long period where I actually enjoyed my football at the academy, um, le learning a lot during that first year uh, under thirteens. Uh, under 14s, I'd say I'd still had a lot of catching up to do, and then come like fi under 15s and the 16s, like I I felt like a really established member, not only of the team that was going to play in in the games at in the 11, but as, like very established within the club, the academy, the staff, the you know the the lads around me. Um, I felt like I was like you know an integral part to what we were. Um, I loved it. And then it got to the, the you know, under 16s, McBeal come in as a coach and um, phenomenal coach. I've not, probably not been coached by anybody better than him ever. 
We spoke with Darius's former coach Mick Bill about what kind of player and person Darius was at Kirby. He was he was a lovely boy. I remember having a conversation with him at the time. Um, he was travelling across from Manchester, so he was travelling across with like Ryan Kent was his big friend, and he lived in a house of just sisters and his mum. So there was like he was. I felt it was a big softy. I'd come from London, like the boys there. I felt were a lot tougher than Darius. He certainly looked tough, but he didn't, he didn't always play tough. He was a good player, athletically very, very good, strong for his age. And he, he, was, a, he was a good player at, at that stage, playing as a centre-half. Um, and it, I think it's a case of like Liverpool, you, you obviously can be a good player 9 to 16, where Liverpool sort of like a recruit you from the northwest. But then when you get to sort of full-time scholar, Liverpool recruit with your best teams in Europe. So even like your AC Milan, in as your Barca and around Madrid. So into that group come players like Pedro Chirivella, Sergi Canios that recruit from Valencia and Barcelona outside. Well, yeah, I remember the distinctively signed my uh, Anfield. Um, pre-season started in July. Um, I moved into digs in July, July the 1st. Um, and we had a couple of tournaments coming up in August, pre-season. Um, and one being the Milk Cup, which is held in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And another one, which was, um, I think it was a few exhibition games that were held in Newark, which is um, next to New York, um, obviously on the east coast of America. Um, I remember um, that Milk Cup tournament, that was the first one. And, um, you know, I, I just, I'm a, I'm a scholar now, I'm, I'm a first year and I'm with the second years, and we're, we're a huge group of maybe 25, 30 lads. And, um, we all went to the Milk Cup and um, my name wasn't on the list uh, to go uh, of every single player. So um, rather than questioning it, I just I just carried on and, you know, just it, it was what it was. It's just like we're taking a squad to the Milk Cup, the youth team. For some reason, you're, you're not going. Um, and then it got to uh, Friday. Uh, uh, it was a Friday and the lads were going on a Sunday and then um, at the time, I was at home, 16. I was, I was, pretty, I was at, and my sister's actually watching football. Um, explaining it to, to her that uh, the lads were going away and that I, I wasn't going, with no explanation why. And um, I got a call off the, the assistant coach saying that uh, that um, somebody had been uh, become injured um, on that Friday and that I'd now be going, um, which was again a contrast of feelings because I, you know, I prepared to be like be the, the one out of 30 that's not going to be going to now going to be obviously going as a backup because somebody's been injured so um, that was the first the first real like sign for me that um, things might not be as rosy or things may not be as the same as what the school years have, may have been um, I went there uh, I think it was a four or five day tournament I don't remember we did, I don't think we did that well, but we didn't do that bad either. Um, you know, we sort of had like a mediocre tournament. Um, I think I played 20 minutes in one game out of the seven or eight. And um, I don't think that was, I think that's just because someone got injured as well. I don't think it's, you know, out of selection or anything like that. And then on the third day, um, the assistant coach who called me about coming, he come to me and um, we had a, a, an analysis meeting about the, the team we were playing the next day and he, he held me back and he, um, he had a little one-on-one -on -one meeting with me and he just told me that, you know, this, um, we have a large group um, in, our, in our youth team this year and that he, he didn't think that I would be getting much playing time this year so uh, maybe I should Re like reconsider my options or you know take that on board and react and you know kick on and you know, try hard I suppose to to get where I needed to be within the team but um, once I heard that from the from the you know the coach I was that had me backpedal from then because I just thought like obviously you guys know that I wasn't even meant to be at the milk cup for a start um, and then to come to come to me and say that I was like you know I didn't really know what to say to him, but I just took it on the chin and it was what it was. I think straight away though, going into that, you're going to feel, if you see a squad list go up and you're the only player held back and not going to a tournament, um, I know you ended up going, but for me, I look at the the social side of that and you're seeing all your mates go on tour together, you're seeing them come back, there'd be all stories about 
what went on when they were away and you know a group of new 16 year olds a new intake are going away and bonding and you're you're left behind so it, straight away it says to me like I'm going to feel worthless and I'm going to have low self-esteem I'm not going to feel as good as these lads and yeah yeah what's the, what's the process like after that definitely um like the lads could almost tell um from like certain body languages and the way that I wasn't my usual bubbly self like on the on the coaches and stuff in when I was in Ireland that you know did and I'd made made it vocal like to the my friends and the team that you know it's a bit weird that I'm not I'm just not like being left out and stuff um yeah um it wasn't until we went we were going to America um until I was left out of that one as well um and that was that wasn't really a tour of like I said, it wasn't. It was a few ex exhibition games. It wasn't really a tournament to where we were competing and we want to be first. It was a few games, um, so that was like every player's going. Like I think even a couple of injured lads went. Like everyone's going because it's a huge trip to America. You it's know? not even about the the tournament. It's a you know you're a lad from a certain part of Manchester. Yeah, so it's a life experience. Yeah. I'm a lad from the only time I've ever thought I'd even see America, even. As a kid, then at 16, would just be on a film. I never thought like New York was just something that was just, it's beyond my, you know, capabilities, my reach in life. It's not something that thing is so, yeah, to, um, to see the list again be put out, like of a squad of like 33 players, and like I'm just there, like on my own, just. You're number 34. Yeah, number 34. Um, from that moment on, my. I'd say passion, commitment, um, love for the game, love for the, the stuff around me. Because it had gone from being like, you know, this general, like, huge involvement in the team, being a schoolboy at 16, to being the other side of 16, to just being a left out, really. Once we'd, we, we got the season rolling, I was a first year scholar, um, I would. I would rarely make the, the 16 on a Saturday. Um, and if I did, I would never be expect, I would never expect to play, like, because there was just, there was players there that, I'd, you know, either they preferred or that had come in signing, you know, deals where they did it invested. And I think after the first three months, four months, I'd like, I decided to start trialing. Um, I trialed at places like um, Wigan, Fleetwood, Berry. Um, Blackburn, um, you know, clubs that I, I could have gone on to have a career with um, at the time, but, you know, numerous reasons why I never was successful on all the different trials I went on. Um, but there was never really no plan for me to be or get myself back into being fa in, in favour. There was never like, oh, OK, we've got loads of players, he's ahead of you, we've invested in him, you know, we've got to play him. but. If you really want to, you know, be that person that's gonna like prove everybody wrong and go on to be what you want to be, there, there was that wasn't in place. It was just deal with it. There'll be 22 lads in the room. Um, majority of the youth team, some like oh, we had injuries, and then we might even have like the best out of the 16s in there, um, finding out whether they'd be playing for the the 18s or the 16s that day. Uh, and I'm sitting in this room as an 18 year old and I was one of the older ones as well um, in my year group. Um, and, you know, uh, the manager at the time, he'd read out the 16 and then the 16 would, inc would have included like two 14 year olds, a 15 year old, um, Alexander Arnold, who you may, you may have heard of, um, Ben Woodburn, who are like, who was considerably younger than me at the time, like four years younger than me at the time. So, like, I'm, I'm in a room. I'm also the biggest player in the room. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm walking out of the meeting knowing that I'm going downstairs to, to go and do a fitness session at 9.30 with the sports scientist for half an hour to go and make up for the, the 90 minutes that I'm now going to miss because the 15 year old's filling my place. Um, and. Business-wise, probably almost rightly so because I was, I was moving on at, well, was going to be moving on at the time, um, and this 15-year-old could be a, you know, a huge player. Like a, they could invest in him heavily, and you know, why not, or why not, like you know, risk him in a game like this and let him see, show him what, 
what he can do, but not knowing that it would the effect it would have on me, like watching a 15 year old take a place of the biggest 18 year old. I'm not gonna lie, like I've, there is, there has been a few match day Saturday nights where. I, where, I, to be honest, I'm going in, I know that I've got to go in on Sunday morning because that isn't my day off anymore, because they all played, that is their day off. I'm going in to train with the lads that didn't play and the lad, like, lads that are coming back from injury to catch up with fitness. But like, I had shed a tear in bed that night previously, knowing that a 14-year-old in a, a match day squad in an under-18 game ahead of me. That, I guess it brings us to a positive aspect I mean, you've said you knew after two and a half, three months you were going to be released. So yeah. there's probably no story to tell about your release. And if you tell me anything different, you knew you were, no, be it's, you were then released. No, it's just a, yeah, a conversation I had um, with Phil. I think I, I said to him, you know, it looks like I'm not going to play a game. Um, I haven't played a game. And if I haven't, it's for the 16. So um, do I look to start trialling now? Or, you know, because I, I thought it's. It's pretty early, like, I only signed three, four months ago and um, the agreement we come to was, yeah, like, you can you can go and, and uh, search for a club. And so. I guess the opportunity that you did get, um, which th that kid from Hume wouldn't have get, unless he was at Liverpool's academy, was the opportunity to go to a university in the United States. Yeah. Now, you had two, uh, two, you had two opportunities on the table at the time. Was it Clemson University in Carolina? Is it North Carolina? Uh, South, South actually. Carolina, yeah, sorry. South Carolina. And Manhattan College in New York. Now, yeah. We've all heard of Manhattan, and you clearly had, because that's the one that turned your head. So can you tell us what was your thought process on how that? Did, how did those opportunities come about? Yeah, yeah so um, I was in my second year of my scholar, 17, um, November. I sat an SAT test. Um, my The education officer, Phil, um, he advised me and another player that, you know, had things not go right at the end of the season, that um, that was an option for us. We can go and take the SAT test and, uh, you know, that would enable us to then enrol into a university into, uh, in America. Um, and at the time I was, he told us about that in September and I was still miles off thinking anything like that. Um, just, you know, beginning my second year and still believe that some club somewhere will take me because I still believe that, you know, I was, at a level that you know matched the requirement. Um, so I sat the SAT in November, and, and then in um, February it was when uh, Phil got me back in and sat me down and said, like, you know, you got your, your result back from your SAT. Um, it isn't the best, but it's a pass, and it, you'll be able to enrol. So I weighed up my options, and I thought, right, like I've been to all these clubs, and I pretty much got nothing left. So. I'll at least hear him out. So um, he come and explained what it'd be like, and he, um, he said, "Yeah, he said, that, you know, I've I've already made like arrangements with with uh, a couple of universities, and um, there's a, a university called Clemson University in South Carolina that we're very interested, in, and Manhattan College, who were based in the Bronx, um, in a private district in the Bronx. Um, he Phil told me that the coach, the head coach from New York." from Manhattan College would be flying over um, next week to come and watch me train. Um, speak to me about what it's like to be living in New York, what it means to be a collegiate like, athlete and and what would, what would be ahead really um, if I was to come. He, he came the, the, the week later, I trained on maybe the Wednesday with the reserves, um, had a good training session and on the Thursday um, Phil sat me down and said that he's, he's you know he's, he's willing to take you and offer you the full scholarship um, pretty much immediately, like, you know, he wants to get all the paperwork started now, so it's done for August, so when you're going to be enrolling. So f for me, like, after dealing with all these rejections and, you know, people saying no and the, f the thought of even going to an another trial to meet another set of lads to be rejected again, I just thought, you know, this, this coach, he's met me, he knows who I am, he knows that I've had six years here and He's watched me play, and he want you know he, he wants me. I'm, I'm I've got a coach who wants me to play again. So um, naively, without even communicating with Clemson University or you know taking their university into you know consideration for me to attend, I jumped at the, the New York opportunity, of course. And um the opportunity to study in America was one that Mick Bill saw as a potentially significant step in Darius's development.
he took a scholarship to go to America. And at the time, I thought it was very, very good for him because I thought it would get him out of his comfort zone of, of the family environment that he had and the friendship group that he had. And I suppose that's the big thing. When you're in these academies now, of course, yes, it's to go and play at the big clubs. I think it's important you don't fall into a black hole when you're in an under-18s or under-23s environment. I think that's a bigger thing that we can debate. But then the other thing is when you're at a big club, the opportunities it gives you to go and travel and the network of the staff meant that Phil Roscoe was able to help him get a very, very good scholarship to America. So I know that Darius went and did that. He'd come back and visit us on a couple of occasions as well. And, and I thought that was, that was going to be a really good thing for him because I felt that the American culture and the way of life, it was a, a big opportunity for him and I thought it would suit him. So I know he went and did that um, in the initial phase. So I was gone. Um, uh, August the 7th, so yeah, that all came around through Phil, um, luckily. August the 7th, I flew to, to JFK Airport um, and to enrol on this new life. I was 18. Um, excited. Excited, unbelievably excited. I think not, not so much just because of the fact that I'm in New York, but I'm about to play in a team that hopefully I can become one of the, you know, the lead players. And, cause I, it's a full scholarship. Yeah, yeah, it's a full scholarship. Um, I'd mentioned before, 8,000 students a private engineering school in the Bronx. Um, the starting fees were $46,500 a year. Um, that's just the first year and they raised to $60,000 a year. So I'm, I've been given that, I've been given, you know, the opportunity to come here and I'm thinking like this is probably the, one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my life so far, I'm only 18. It's understandable that Darius was excited. Not only was he going to one of the biggest and most famous cities on the planet, he was in a US college system that takes sports so seriously that games were televised and played in front of significant crowds. And we're joined now by Darius Waldron, one of our key players from tonight's match. And Darius, first off, your first start here with Manhattan. Tell us about the match. Uh, I think uh, it was disappointing. I think we, um, we've lost couple of games on the bounce now and as my first game I really wanted to come in and change things but it wasn't to be but I think the biggest problem I had was I was now in New York at 18 new friends um, I was valued by my teammates and by everybody around me but now the problem that I have now is that I have all this but I haven't I don't feel like I've progressed one bit at all like I've been playing right back every game um, against teams who have Probably better than us. Most of us, we got, we did, we did lose the majority of our games that season. We won a, won a few, drawn a few. Um, and my problem was, is that I want, I all I wanted to do was prove. I still, I still needed to prove to Liverpool that they made the wrong decision. Um, and that's all I cared about. Like, yeah, I did the uni. I did as much work as I needed to, um, to you know, to pass and stuff. But my goal was to be that person who they let go and, you know, made it in America and stuff. Um, speaking with some of the players about their post, like, post-Christmas plans and the, the big break that we have after Christmas until the season starts again in the following fall season. And, you know, some of them were speaking about um, wanting to smoke marijuana. Some of them were speaking about, you know, can't wait to be going out, like, three days a week, without like, girls, university stuff, like, all, all the things you do when you, I suppose, when you're a, late teenager, early early adult, and that is exactly just what I wasn't interested in at all. What scared me was is that nobody here wants to be a footballer apart from me, and that's what worried me a lot. Like, I, you know, I remember, I do remember a lot of things, um, sat in the canteen, they said, you know, before you, um, before you, you joined here, like, did you not trial or I think about staying in England? So I said, told them the story about me trialling and not working and this, that, the other, and um, I just had two offers really here in Clemson University and then it's like the whole the whole table stopped, put the knife and fork down and said, what? And I just said, yeah, I just had an offer from here in Clemson University and they was like, and you sat here with us and I was like, I didn't really understand like why they were so shocked, but until I did my own research and found out that, you know, the best, if you look at alumni from the NBA, look at alumni from the NFL, the majority of the the best, like I'm talking the best sporting players ever, like from golf to anything, came out of Clemson University. 
yeah, I got to my end of season meeting and I um, I expressed them feelings to my coach Jordan and, and told him that you know I was yeah again like so grateful for what you've done for me in the last four months and you've literally turned like me around mentally almost. But I feel like to, like this isn't just where I want to be and finish. Like I want to really go on and be, become something that other coaches and other people in the past didn't think I, I could become. And um, yeah, it, it didn't really work out well for me. The meeting, um, it you know. So you told him so you needed to leave Manhattan College, or better, yeah. preferably Clemson College. Yeah, I told him that. In in those words, I pretty much said I feel that for me to progress and for me to go into the MLS because that's the highest division in this country, I'd probably need to go to a top forty university so then I could have more exposure to the MLS teams that are recruiting from the you know from the from the colleges and stuff because in division 1 out there like I, I think at the time I I checked the rankings in Manhattan Co Manhattan College we stood 173rd um Clemson were first so you have a conversation with your coach at uh Manhattan and say to him I want to leave yeah um, uh, for that, he needed to, did he need to rip up your contract or what had to happen, what did happen? For that, he'd need to, you'd have to agree um, to releasing me. His best player? Yeah, releasing me from my um, scholarship. Because um, they'd committed them, f them four years of, or the money they committed to me them four years was still on the line, it could never be pulled. So he'd have to release me from that. Um, he refrained me from joining any other team in our in our league that we played in that district of um, the East Coast of America, um, which didn't really bother me too much because they weren't really schools that were sought after by MLS clubs. Um, I left. Uh, I had that meeting around mid mid December and was due to fly home on the twenty second of December. Um, I did do that, and I spent January until. August of the year after, which would have been 2016, um, literally emailing every single university. They were in the top 40 in, um, in the collegiate soccer division one out there. Um, the reason why nothing ever formalised for me going back to America is um, I think I, I took one of my classes I was sitting during my time at uni there was a math class and I only sat half the exam and didn't do the other half because We'd had this. We'd had the the meeting before the final exam, so I just thought, like, you know, I can't, I can't believe he's, you know, you don't want to help me, and um, I made Liverpool aware. Sat half the exam and I flew home on the twenty twenty second. Little to know that not sitting that other half of the exam and having obviously the coach understandably losing his like, best player and not helping me all want to move on. That that's actually the reason why I couldn't go and enrol somewhere else because I didn't have enough credits to enrol into another university with having missing that January to August period, which is a whole semester in in university, which is what they call it out there. So you found yourself back in the UK, a little bit stranded. Yeah. What you wanted to do is go back to the states. That was not an really on offer. Stranded. And. I guess I've written down the word drifted. I mean, at that point, you drifted football wise and work wise between jobs, between non league football clubs. So, yeah. just kind of tell us about what happened December 2015 onwards. Yeah, um, just turned 19 on the 24th. Um, so, I'm 19 now. Um, I don't have a job. I go, I spend that January to August of 2016 trying to go back to uni. I just started going around playing for different semi-pro clubs. Um, can I run you through what, based on our research? Yeah, research? yeah, if you can. We've got February 2016, New Mills FC, March 2016, Main Road FC, July 2016, Norfolk Victoria, September 2016, Cheadle Town, uh, November 2016, 1874, Northwich, August 2017, Stockport Town, August 2018, Withenshaw, October 2018, Winsford United, who own the ground at 1874, Northwich play for. Correct. Um, and then I think you did train in the um, National League North with, with Ashton, which actually things start to get a bit better in, in 2018 for you, football-wise. Now, obviously, that's a two-year period we just run across, but in terms of, uh, we, I use the phrase, drifted, um, that kind of sums it up quite nicely, isn't it? Because you just, you weren't enjoying football, you were doing it because yeah. you were good at it. But it I was, was roaming. 
Yeah. I was literally roaming, um, going from team to team. Um, every every team, you know, I realised that like you know, there's players here that have never played before. I'm, you know, it's, it doesn't suit me. I might not been able to get there. I don't drive. It's a forty minute drive from my house. Things like that. I was literally roaming from team to team, as that description perfectly actually describes. Yeah, um, so that was it from New Mills to tr like trying to take over, thinking I'm going to go back to America August to Main Road. Um, nothing ever formalised. So 1874 Northwich, I signed for them. Um, they'd probably be my, my longest spell in terms of semi pro. Um, I like the managers, and my best friend also played for them. Um, he plays a key role in my life, actually. Uh, my best friend, Tyler, Tyler Edwards, he um exactly the same age as me. Um, arguably, probably be a, bit, a better footballer than I was as a kid. Um, or he'd say. <laughs> um, but no, he's a, re a really nice um, really nice lad group where I did and played for that Fletcher Moss team that I played uh, for as well as a 10 to 12 year old. And the reason why he, he's, so, he's so important to me in my life now and back then is because as I was roaming then in 2016, he also roamed with me. So he, the teams I was at, he was then going to too. Um, we were both living at home with our parents, um, no income. So life was like, it was crazy. There was no structure. There were, I didn't work hard, I didn't train for anyone. I just trained on a Thursday, played on a Saturday. But then September 2017, um, we, we went for a night out and um, I've never been a big drinker, uh, so when we was out, I was I was always the one back door in it to McDonald's at half one, like sober as a judge. Um, and about one a.m. we're in the nightclub, and um, we we're stood there in the corner. I'd, like I said, I don't drink; I wasn't intoxicated or anything. And uh, it was dark in the club, and then the lights come on all of a sudden. So it's like being in a dark room in a nightclub, and the lights are sh like shining bright, like I don't know, like the staff are in there, and it's a normal work day. And the club starts empty, and so we're kind of like in the corner thinking, man, what's going on? Like, is it closing? It's 1 a.m., like it's your birthday, you're 21. But we, we had to leave because everybody else was leaving, you know. We were the one of the last ones to leave in the corner of the club, and then we got outside. Um, there must have been at least like 50 police officers, 20 police vehicles, ambulances, like, just, it was a huge scene. You, you just knew something had happened. Um, so we're kind of like gathering together, like our own friendship group. It wasn't just me and him, we went out, it was like three or four of us. Um, but we never, when we go out, we, I, we're not big or out. As like I said, Tyler played football himself. He was, at, he was a, 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 a whitey at Morecambe himself. Um, we literally stood there for five minutes, trying to gather what's going on. And then these people start coming out, uh, running out of nowhere, chasing after each other. Um, we don't know what's going on. And then a bottle um, out of the sky comes out of nowhere, lands on my friend's head, my best friend's head, Tyler. Um, lands right in the crown of his head, puts a big gash here, and then it's like a blood explodes out of his head. Um, so it's like, where did that come from? But more importantly, like he's probably gonna die. Like if we don't stop the bleeding um, now. So uh, I was with him, took my jumper off, tried to stop the bleeding and stuff. Um, his reactions were, to me now, funny, but not that then, but they, because he's trying to react in an, in an aggressive way because he can feel a bottle, it's just like an object that's gone off his head, but I knew it was a bottle, but he's also doing that whilst collapsing at the same time, like falling faint on the floor, so. The 10 minutes after that was crazy because we're slowly, we're slowly beginning to find out that there's like, you know, there's a group of people who are brawling against another group of people, but we didn't know that at the time. But whilst the brawling, one of the bottles has missed everybody and hit him. Um, so yeah, so he's bleeding. I'm trying to help him up, get, you know, stop the bleeding and stuff. And eventually, 10 to 15 minutes later, um, you know, he, I calm him down because he's, he's, he's still a bit drunk. I need to, you know, make sure he's relaxed first. Get him in the car and get him to hospital because that isn't, the, the, the gash isn't going to stop. 
um, somebody else who we were with who hadn't been drinking had also been injured to the point where he, need, uh, he needed uh, surgery on his, on his wrist. So them two, um, they went into a car on the way to the hospital. Um, I, I still, none of us know, known what's going on inside this, this nightclub. Um, I just know that he's like badly, badly wounded, my friend. So, well, uh, I live, I've always lived Manchester City Centre, always with my mum. Uh, so it isn't actually that far from my house where we're, you know, we're nightclubbing. It's a 15 minute walk if you walk quick. I'm not intoxicated. So after what's just happened, I decided to walk down Deansgate and just walk home. So Tyler's been put in an ambulance at this point? Tyler's been put in, in a car, been taken to the hospital at this point. So I'm walking, I'm on my own. Um, and as, as Tyler's been hit by the bottle, I'm, I've, kind of, I've, I've looked in the direction it's come from and I can, I kind, I can see the group of where it has come from. Um, so I, I, I know who's done it, but there's like this 30 plus, I don't, I don't know who or what. Um, he's in the car, I'm walking on, it's, it's, I'm getting goosebumps even like, you know, retelling the story. Um, it's about 1.30 now and I'm walking down Deansgate and I come across these four lads um, on their own, but they, they're all quiet, they're not saying anything. And one of them's particularly wearing a, a striped blue jumper. And I've, look, I've looked at him and I've, I looked up and I said, um, I remember looking at him saying, Yous were, I said, you were just fighting over there, wasn't you? And they both, they both looked at me and um, replied in a, in a Birmingham accent. And um, they said, nah, nah, we, we wasn't. And I said, no, you were, because my friend, like, and before I even got to finish the sentence, they started running like, away from me. So in that moment, after what had happened, my reaction, whether it was right or wrong, was to follow the ones who were running because I, I genuinely believed that I'd actually bumped into the people who had just, I don't know what injury Tyler had, but they'd caused it. So, you know, um, I ran after them. We ran around the corner and we were both detained by police because it was that, the presence was that heavy. Um, they wanted to know why I was running after four lads. You've just come straight around the corner all of a sudden, there's just a load of cops. All, all of a sudden, like running around that corner and there's, there's 50 coppers there. Um, so they've got me, they've got the four lads and I've, I've, I'm quickly getting it out of, you know, I'm out of breath, but I'm quickly saying that they have just like threw an object at my friend who's on the way to hospital. And I know for a fact it's them because I've just eyewitnessed it happen. Um, and that was, that was what I told them. Um, I was arrested um, for a fray. And then I was arrested on suspicion of murder. Um, so I'm, which was absolutely bizarre to me because I'm thinking, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and I only found it, I only find this out the next day, but whilst we're in the club, in the corner, um, before this is all happening, somebody was, somebody was um, brutally stabbed in his neck and... Um, is this inside the club? Inside the club, uh, near the entrance. He was stabbed in his neck. Um, as it happened, he was stabbed. He, he somehow manages to run out outside the club with the, with the wound, collapses outside of the club and coincidentally dies underneath an ambulance that's parked up on, res on, on response, that's like waiting to, you know, for a response call. Um, I, I only know this though, like the day after, obviously. Um, so I've gone from being arrested for a fray, um, probably gonna be released there and then because I hadn't done anything, they just see me chase four lads for nothing, to now being arrested on suspicion of murder because I've got- Where were you when you were arrested for murder? Dean's Gate. Um, just around this corner where I'd chased these lads. The reason why it turned into that is because Tyler's blood was from head to toe on me as well. And I didn't know, but the police know what's just happened inside the club. So because I've got all this blood on me, it looks like I, and I haven't got an injury myself. It looks like I've done something to somebody and like I've got it all on me. So yeah, um, 135, something like that on the way to, on the way to the police station in the back of a van thinking like, I wasn't worried because I knew I hadn't murdered anybody for a, for a start off and obviously- To hear those words spoken to you, yeah, scary thing. I'm thinking, yeah, like, arrested for murder. Like, the, the only thing that was on my mind was that I couldn't wait for them to find out that I haven't done anything like that. Um, now, 
in my interview when I got to the station, it was still early hours in the morning. I'd, um, I'd had all my clothes taken off me. I'd had all samples taken from me, from urine to fingernails to hair samples, everything, because obviously I'm still under suspicion. Um, the, way I, the way I was raised, if the police are ever asking me anything, I, I don't, you're not meant to say anything. And that's not, I'm not saying that's right or that's wrong. I'm just saying that's just the way I was culturally raised. Um, I'd never, me play, starting playing for Liverpool and doing well in school, I never had intentions of being in trouble with the police in my life anyway. So, um, I, during my interview, I, I just had no comment because I knew I hadn't done anything. And then they asked me, they, but one question they did ask was, um, was about the blood that was on me and uh, who it belonged to. Um, and I said, I actually, from all the other questions, I replied no comment, but to this specific one, I, I actually said like, I can, I didn't say no comment, I just said I can, that I could guarantee you that this blood belongs to somebody who is my friend and there is absolutely, like, you, you're arresting me on suspicion of murder and there is absolutely no way, when, once you find out who I am, that, that you know, that it was me for a start or that I, I'm capable of that and all the other questions, I just remained with no, no comment because I knew I hadn't done anything. Um, the maximum time you're allowed to hold somebody when you're arrested is 24 hours in a police station without a charge, and I was held for 23. So I was released the next morning at 3 a.m. in like a prison tracksuit, prison pumps, still under suspicion. We will have to leave Darius's story here for part one in this episode. His story is too long and incredible to do justice in a one hour episode. Please come back for part two where we'll pick up where we left off. Thanks for listening to this episode of Football Journeys um, and thank you to all those who supported us. Do come and find us on social media at Journeys Pod on both Twitter and Instagram where we'll be sharing more content. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us on footballjourneys at b5consultancy.com or visit our webpage b5consultancy.com slash footballjourneys. This podcast is produced by B5 Consultancy alongside Ricky Valentine, who himself had an academy journey with me at Brentford FC. Special thanks goes to the Hope Street Hotel for their hospitality and Liverpool FC for supplying some of their archive footage. Lastly, thanks to the lads for telling their stories and to the contributors who gave up their time to share their memories of the lads. Please do like and subscribe. If you feel we deserve a five-star rating, then please give us one. The more successful this podcast is, the better chance we have of producing more, more episodes and further series.